The Money and Medals Network presents Robert Bracey on EG15, Hvishka's Main Gold Mint Phase 5. What does it mean and should anyone care? A presentation to the Oriental Numismatic Society. So, today I'm going to be talking about a particular part of the coinage of the Kushan Emperor Hvishka. The titles there that are important are What does it mean and should anybody care? I've given these sorts of presentations before where I've looked at fairly narrow bits of Kushan coinage and this is really narrow. So one of the questions that comes out is, yes, we learn lots of interesting things, but do any of those things actually matter? Do they have any impact on our historical understanding? And the particular bit I'm looking at is EG1B, uh, which is uh, Huvishka's principal gold mint, the phase five issues. And I'll be primarily looking at at the full units. Uh, just to put this in context, this is northern India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, the Central Asian states. This is roughly the part of the world you're talking about when you're talking about the Kushans. Here is politically what it looked like in the second century AD. So we have the Kushan Empire uh, from Bactria, this is sort of eastern Afghanistan, running down through the Punjab and including a small outpost around the city of Matara, south of Delhi, surrounded by various other kingdoms, <coughs> which I won't mention. The particular king we're talking about is Huvishka, and Huvishka is the fifth of 13 Kushan emperors who ruled from the middle of the 1st century AD to the middle of the 4th century. So there are six mints within Huvishka's empire, Two of them producing gold, uh, one in Bactria, in the north, one further south, and four producing copper at different points. Within the principal gold mint, which is this mint located in Bactria in the north, we can subdivide its production into six phases. So this is all material that will appear in the catalogue that Joe and I are producing as part of the Kushan Coins Project when it's eventually published, which will be far off in the future. But for those who are interested, I actually have a copy of the first 150 pages of the catalogue with me. It's a draft if you want to take a look at it at some point during the sessions today. We're interested in this bit here, phase five of the mint production. Roughly speaking, each of the main phases used about the same number of dies to make its coins, so that we assume of roughly in size. I don't think that assumption is entirely valid. I'll come back to why later. So we're looking at, we guess, the period between AD 173 and AD 181, right? Give or take, you know, 50-year margin of error. And this is what they look like. They have the king on the obverse wearing this elaborately decorated tunic and a crown. They are not the earlier coins in which the king wears a plain shirt, and they are not the later coins in which the king something wrapped round his conical crown. Nor are they coins that look very similar, but in which the king has a cloak or a mantle over his shoulders, which are issued by the subsidiary mint. So if you've got a gold Kushan coin, if you're fortunate enough to possess such an item, then you can identify this particular group of coins very clearly from the obverse design. There are two unusual designs in this phase. So most face left have this design. There is an example where he's facing left, it's got the same design, but instead of being just the torso of the king, the king is seated cross-legged on the front. There is an example where he's facing right and he's got what looks like a turban or something like that wrapped around his head, but it shares much of the same decoration of the, the king's tunic. Now, this is the process we're going through in terms of doing the catalogue, is how do we categorise this material? So uh, the, the material as a whole, we can point out as a particular moment of production of the mint. All of these coins were made together, they follow the ones that come before and they proceed the ones that come after. But the process we're going through is how do we then subdivide this coinage in order to 
present it in catalog terms. And part of the reason that I'm giving this presentation about this particular group is because in December, I thought this was done. And because this is probably one of the best studied bits of Prashant and Coinage. I thought we, we pretty much got this. Everybody's already done the work here. And I still haven't quite finished this bit of the catalogue. It's been nightmarishly difficult to work out the details. And so it's been very, very difficult to work out the details of exactly how this fits together. And it's been necessary to go back to the research work that we've been doing and try to make more sense of that in order to get a solid understanding that we can then present in the catalogue. And one of the processes is how do we subdivide the different obverse types? And the first thing that we do is we look at the jacket that the king is wearing. In some coins, he is wearing a jacket that's clearly fastened together by two clasps at the front. On some coins, he's wearing the same jacket, but it's open and we can see a decorated shirt underneath. And on some coins, he is not wearing the jacket. The two clasps essentially vanish. And we can see that there's no jacket tendered. So that was the, the, the first bit of the process. And we can then go a bit further. So we've got these three main categories. We can look at the ears. These turn out to be crucially important. At the beginning, I think, of this section, you can see the king's ear. Very quickly, you can't because it's covered by a part of the crown or helmet which has got a sort of jeweled dotted pattern on it. So we can, we can see coins with ears, coins with ears not visible, and then we can subdivide that further. We've got round hats, pointed hats. We've got kings with a diadem over their shoulder. I'll come back to that. Kings with flames coming from their shoulder. Kings holding a standard over his shoulder instead of a instead of a spear. And then we can we've got these categories. And what we end up with is a set of different types. There's a lot of those types, and there's very few dice. So for maybe three or four of those types, we've got multiple dies. For most of those types, the mint only made one die that corresponds to that particular combination of group. So we have this, this standard, the king's holding over his shoulder, and this has been variously described in the past. And there, there was a period of talking about it as a, a bird standard. There was a single coin of Kanishka in which there's a wiggly line that looks like a bird. So presumably the standard is the same thing. And there is an early Dubishka coin on which there is a wiggly line that looks a bit like a bird. And at this particular point in the mint, there's six dies. And as you can see, they look like um, a slug, three blobs, a duck, um, a space alien, and a small dog. And this one actually looks like some sort of four-legged animal. I think this is a lion. I think we can be reasonably confident this is probably a lion. This one does kind of look a bit like a lion, and we do have this much later coin of the Kushan Emperor Mahi, which appears to be depicting the same thing, and that looks more convincingly like a lion. It looks like other depictions of lions we see on seal. So we're probably looking at a lion standard. The people at the Mint probably understood that what they were making was a lion. Whether or not anybody who ever saw the coins understood that what they were making was a lion is less clear. And the reverses. One of the reasons that Phase 5 of May Mint is so interesting is because of the variety of reverse designs that appeared there. These depict, they're all the same type. They all have a god, or in a few cases, more than one god, and a label next to the god saying who that god is. And there are 17 of them at the moment. That's almost all of the gods that appear on the reverses of Vishka's coins. And of those, 10 are new to this mint at this phase. So these are entirely new gods who've never previously been used by this mint. And of those, 5 are essentially only seen here. Um, in, in Hvishka's reign. And particularly interesting most of those are Ahura Mazda, which is otherwise entirely unknown on Kushan coins. Tia, who is otherwise unknown. We've only recently seen this one. Dionysius, who is shown on Kushan's. And Yamsho, who's only really known here. 
these are not the only gods that this mint depicted. I'm, I think I can say that with nearly 100% confidence. Given the number of designs we have, and the number of these that are new since the last time somebody tried to do a comprehensive study of these, there are almost certainly designs that have not survived to us, but which were made. So in 20, 30 years' time, with another 500 coins from this mint, we will probably have two or three more gods. So there may have been as many as 20 or more. And some of them may be gods that are not seen anywhere else in the Mishka Tongue. So this particular phase is very, very interesting. When you read books that talk about the diversity of gods that appear on Kushan coins, they, uh, they illustrate things. They're frequently illustrating this. They're not illustrating all of the coinage of the Kushan. They're actually not even illustrating all the coinage of Kavishka. They're usually just illustrating this bit here, where these, these gods appear for the first time. And one of the processes we've had to go through is developing reverse typologies to match with gods. And this is the reverse typology for Faro. And there are certain characteristics of the god that are very obviously important. Uh, in the case of Faro, it's what he's doing with the hand he holds out to the king. So the basic iconography is very simple. The king is on one side looking very magisterial and important. And on the reverse, the god is offering something. And it's, it's a sort of divine support. I'm giving the king rulership or authority or might or victory. And so Pharaoh can be divided up depending on whether or not what he's offering the king is flames, which are Pharaoh's divine attribute, whether he's offering a gesture of blessing, this is very common, or whether he's offering a diadem to the king, so handing him the authority. And they can also be divided up based on whether or not Pharaoh is holding a scepter or a sword. And then within those, you can further divide them, and frequently based on the costume that Farah is wearing. For some reason that isn't clear, the mint introduces, introduces an entirely new type of costume to the gods. The gods have previously worn very long robes with cloaks. Now suddenly they wear short tunics. And this happens at some point during this mint's production. Uh, this is the typology for a new god. So this is Shao Riro, and this is his typology. And we can break it up based on how he's represented with regard to the tanga, and where the legend goes, whether or not he has a halo. But his depiction is all pretty similar. He is wearing armor, carrying a shield, and usually holding a spear. So he's a warrior god of some sort. He's entirely new. So the mint introduces this new god, and when it does, this becomes one of the main designs. So within that range of 17 designs I previously showed you, it's very important to remember that there are six that are really significant. And all of the rest occur very occasionally. We've got one die, two dies of them. But the six that keep recurring. And here's a bit about Shariro. He's Sharivar in Iranian things, the genius of imperial might. And his depiction looks very Roman. You can find Roman coins with a very similar looking depiction on, but we can find local <coughs> productions. This is a seal from Taxilla with a warrior god looking very similar. This is a piece of Gandharan art, which again you can see spear arm, holding a shield, wearing a similar sort of armour. This is this is not a divinity, this is part of a big frieze showing the, the Buddha fending off the armies of evil. And then we've got Miro. Miro is another one of these six important gods. So back on that first slide, at the top I placed the six gods who are very important. And again we're doing the, the, the same process, we're dividing him up by these different things creating a typology of that, different types. The reason, by the way, that some of these say uh, things like 3R plus and 3Q plus plus, what that means is Robert missed this the first time he was writing the list. <laughs> <laughs> and it should come just after R. So he had to uh, add to the plus to the end of that. Uh, when he's reasonably confident he's got everything, or at least got everything, or at least is unwilling to look further at his study in case there's anything more there, at that point, he'll renumber them all so they're in the right order. Uh, now, I'm going to talk a little bit about something un something that's important for this, but it's not related to Sean Coins, it's much more general, and that's the concept of dye wear. Some people may have attended talks I've done in the past about dye studies. Uh, dye studies are where we use the coins to try and reconstruct the actual tools, the dyes that we use to make them, and how those tools relate to each other. And dye studies can be divided into three sorts of analysis. 
we can do statistical analyses with them. I'll mention that a little bit later. That's taking the whole corpus of all the dyes you know about and doing calculations based on those. We can look at the relationship between which dyes, which dyes, which reverse dyes will be used for which obverse dyes, and what that might tell us about the organisation of it. And the other sort of study we can do, but we can only do it when we've got really, really good samples, is intra dye analysis, where we look at the sort of wear that the dye exhibits. We look at one dye and we examine different coins made by the same dye and look at what those different coins tell us about what happened to the dye. And one of the things we're looking for are wear on things. And so what I've done is quickly here done a classification of different types of wear. Sometimes in the background of the coin, we get parallel marks. Those don't occur from mechanical stresses. Right? Mechanical stresses don't work like that. They are almost certainly polishing marks. When the dye is initially prepared, somebody polishes the surface and then they start engraving into it. And they leave behind the polishing marks on the bit they didn't engrave. And if the dye has not been used very much, those polishing marks have not been obliterated and they are present on well-preserved specimens of the coin. So this is an example of, of a, a dye that's in its very earliest. A different sort of fine lines are radial striations. These are small fine lines that tend to be at the outside of the coin, pointing in towards the centre. These are the results of mechanical stress. So as a die is hammered, gradually loses these working marks and begins to exhibit these small fractures moving in towards the centre of the coin. Uh, we also see smoothing. As the die wears what are originally sharp edges on the die, gradually get battered, because it's a pretty violent process. So if anybody's ever seen a reconstruction, a French team do a reconstruction of this, uh, two of them stand there with their dies, and they swing a huge two-handed hammer over their head. Bam, bam. And apparently, if they get the angle of the dies wrong, they've told me, they can shoot the coin out from between the two dies and embed it into a piece of wood. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a pretty violent process, and you gradually get a gradual obliteration. You, you don't see very much of it on Kashan coins, you see a bit. You can see on that side it's quite crisp, on this side it's quite smooth. It's very hard to detect this, but it is possible. What we usually look for is that on the reverse die it's still fairly crisp, because then we can see it's not the coin being smoothed, it's the, it's the die. We get adhesions. Something might stick to the die, usually a small bit of metal. It stays on the die, and if something is stuck to the die, what it does is it produces depression in the coin. Right? So where we see a depression on the coin, that's something bumping up an adhesion on the die itself. Uh, they're not particularly useful because they tend to drop back off again. So you get them on some coins, so they, they appear and they, they, then they vanish if you're looking at the way a die progresses. We get cracks. Now these are slightly different to the radial striations because they're not very fine on the surface. They're usually a bit more dramatic. They usually grow over time. Once the die begins to crack, there's obviously some flaw and it, it carries on growing. And here we can see one progressing off one of the letters here, and that gets longer. It starts about like this, and it gets to this, and it carries on growing there. We get pits. This is quite common. Uh, bits of the surface of the die just flake away. This is not the most dramatic example of Shan coin, but it is from this period. We, we have an amazing example from the subsidiary mint, where a bit of the surface of the die just flakes away, and literally a huge chunk eventually just falls out of the surface of the die. And for years it's been, people have looked at the coins and gone, that looks like a chicken. Uh, but usually they pick a more warlike bird than chicken, but it does look more like a chicken than anything else. And so they've said, oh, Huvishka must be holding a, a bird standard of some sort. But what they're looking at is just a chunk that's fallen out of the centre of the die. Uh, and here we, we have tiny little pits beginning to appear around this die. We also get, and this is a very uncertain example, so I'm not saying this coin necessarily is this. We get an example of corrosion. This is sometimes known in medieval studies as rusted dyes. And what you get is like a texture on the surface of the coin, which if you compare several coins, you find they've all got the same texture. So it's not a result of some sort of corrosion attacking the coin. It's presumably a result of some sort of corrosion attacking the die. The die has been left lying around for too long, and somebody has then used it. We tend not to see very much about Kushan coins because presumably when they made their dyes, they either took enough care not to use corroded dyes or they didn't need the dyes lying around a long time in wet conditions to be corroded. This is not a Kushan coin. Hopefully everybody can realise it doesn't look like it. This is a Celtic coin and the reason for this is the last type of dye where you get, the last category of dye where is striking, where something 
some blow is inflicted on the on the die itself to damage it. And I don't have any examples of that in Kushan coins, but I do have this lovely example from Celtic coin. What's happened is somebody's forgotten to put a blank <laughs> between the two dies. They've taken their hammer and they've hit the two dies really hard, and the obverse design of a horseman with a little circle over his head has been impressed into the other die. It's an amazingly careless thing to happen. It requires A, that you're incompetent enough not to put a blank in between the two dies, and it requires B, that you don't care when you do it and carry on using the die despite the, uh, the production. So Celtic workmen, incompetent and unwilling to correct mistakes. Kashan workmen, not. Okay, <laughs> that's, what we, that's what we've learned from that. So um, the reason that this is really useful is because we can take this and apply it to the obverse dies that I have for this section, of which I have lots of examples. The, the Kushan die I have the most examples of, I have 72 examples of that die. I don't have quite the, that many in this phase, but I have six dies I have more than 20 examples of. So it's, it's a substantial number. And this is, a, this is an example of this, is a obverse 92 in our study. We get gradual accumulation cracks and general wear on the die, which allows us to give a sort of order to the production. So we can see, oh look, uh, the die that has god Yamsha, who's new to this period, precedes the die that has Shaorero, also new to this period. And then we've got three dies used together, Shaorero, Weisho, Mao. So we can, we can get an order, a sense of when these were made. The coin is then recut. So the engraver takes the damaged die and retools it, presumably to keep the die running a bit longer uh, or to fix problems that have arisen because of the corrosion. And it's quite a systematic recut. And initially, I entered these as two separate dies in the study. But down by his arm, there is, and you can't really see it on the screen, but there's a little semicircular crack, which is the same on, on both sets. And it's just the sort of thing that doesn't happen by accident. This is, so it's the same guy. And this, this became quite common in looking back at this group. I realized that in many cases, I'd separated things into two different dies that were, in fact, the same die, but somebody had made a very comprehensive effort to retool it to keep it going for much longer. And so we get... This is the, for the previous section. This is the new die that's connected to the recut. And this appears to actually be some damage on the surface of the die that's paired. So we get to split up material after the recut. And at the end of it, we get one of these diagrams. Uh, people who have come to my talks before have seen these diagrams before. These are graphs of the different coins showing the die we've just been looking at, giving indications of order. And the other two obverse dies that we know are connected to those reverses. And I mark the gods that are involved. Yamsho, Shariro, Mao, Weisho, Faro, Raskin, Dionysius, Shariro, Ardoksho. And this is one of the interesting things. Ardoksho, the two dies come together. Shariro, the two dies come together. Now we have a really good example of this from the subsidiary mint, where it's absolutely clear because of this die progression that the reverse designs are batch controlled. That you get two or three Ardokshos, then two or three Faros, then a single Weisho two Ardokshos. And when the new two Ardokshos come in, they're a slightly different design to the last two Ardokshos. The mint is controlling something over time by changing its reverses, and it changes the god in order to do that. If it needs to make more than it can make with one reverse die, it makes a second reverse die of that type. Is this the same thing? It's not clear. The evidence from this is not as dramatic as it is in the subsidiary mint. It's possible that what we're seeing is the mint engaging in some sort of batch control, but hard to tell. Part of the reason I've got a problem reconstructing what the mint's doing is that I don't have much in the way of die groups. That die group I just showed you, that's the best example I've got, which is very, very strange, because I've probably got every obverse die that this mint made. Right? That's what the statistics seem to imply, that I've got pretty much every obverse die that this mint made. The Warren Estes formula, which I think as a rule tends to overestimate the number of dies that originally exist, says I, I've got 22. It says I should have 24.1. I, I don't think that the 0.1 die is ever going to turn up. But, <laughs> uh, the, the other two are, are definitely there. However, I've got 250 examples because I've got 123 reverse dies. 
the formulas indicate that I should have 242 reverse dice. I've only got half the dice. And that's why there are only eight die links between obverse dice in the whole. Now, the, part of the problem is these are slightly doubtful figures because they're based on assumptions that aren't true. They assume that dies progress, their way progresses mechanically, and that at a certain cutoff you stop using it because the die is no longer usable. That's not the case here. We've already seen it. it's not the case for the obverse dies. Somebody is repairing the dies, so they're not coming to the end of their useful life when their mechanical stress has reached the final point. Somebody just goes and recards them. So they're being extended beyond what the formulas think the useful life of the dies would actually be. It's also not true of the reverses. These are the various obverse dies divided up by <coughs> different types, and this is how many of them there are. And you will see there's, there's a couple of them that there's very, very few of these particular types, and there's some of them that there's lots and lots of. Uh, and again, this isn't this doesn't look like a random distribution. It looks like some dies just weren't used very much. Somebody made them, they made a small number of coins with them, they stopped using the die. And some dies were deliberately extended and kept running for a very long period. So these are not the result of random figures. And, and because we, I don't have the die groups, I can't tell you what order these coins were made in. I, I've got some clues. On a few of the designs, the legend is truncated. Inclined to guess that that's at the end of the period rather than the beginning. That's how it usually works. Usually people start out well and become more careless. On one or two, there's an epsilon in the legend for Ueshki, for the king's name, whereas usually there's an I. So on the, on the copper coins, it's always an epsilon. Here, it's almost always an I on gold. Well, on these particular two dies, it's an epsilon. Well, that doesn't look like something that's going to happen at the very beginning, so these are presumably not the first dies. The structure of it looks a bit like the ones with the ear, might be at the beginning, and that unfortunately is particularly confusing, because this one has both an epsilon and an ear. So we're, we're left... To, we're left wondering, what's the, what's the order here? Uh, and made doubly worse by the fact that some of these probably overlap, but we just can't see the die links between them because of that appallingly bad sample of reverse dies. We might think that copying errors might help us. Um, is the cross-legged king inspired by the cross-legged king that appears on the copper coinage? But even those, these are not ticking help. This is, this is a wonderful example. This is, the Her this is a Heracles die in this period, uh, showing Heracles standing, holding his club in his hand, Right, with a lion skin over his arm. And on this side is also Heracles. Very, very similar design, same thing. But over his arm, the lion's kind of banished and just been replaced by a few lines. And there's a tail. So he's holding a tail in his hand instead of a lion. And in the legend, instead of it saying Heracilo, which is presumably quite a correct Bactrian version of Heracles, it says Ishakilo. So well, this looks like a copyist copying this and making an error. This coin was made at least 20 years before this coin. This coin is from this bed. So these two coins are not copied from each other, but since these are clearly copies, there's presumably a common prototype somewhere. But why has this mint never produced this design, despite having the design available for, for several decades? It hasn't copied it from this coin, you, you know, unless the person involved knows a great deal more about Heracles, than we have some reason to suspect, and has deliberately copied this and corrected the errors. Well, that seems unlikely. I'll just to talk briefly. I wonderful thing about recording the lectures is I wasn't sure if Joe had covered this when he spoke last time about the king's iconography. So I put his lecture on while I was doing the presentation. Let's do it. No, he hadn't really covered the, this particular point here about the elaborate diadem. At this point, at the mint, they get a new design on the reverse for the god's diadem that he's holding out to the king. Gets these little bars on it, like a garland around it. And at the same time, they get this laddered diadem coming down over the shoulders. The two seem to be merged together to some extent in the next phase, because the king gets this odd-looking thing around his conical cap, which is presumably this diadem, because it's two little ties coming the back of it. This, with this sort of weird ladder diadem on the sides, is presumably a continuation of what the main mint has been doing since the beginning of its coinage, which is to have dashes representing the diadem rather than straight lines. Where's this design coming from? Well, you can find it on Roman coins. I managed to get as far back as AD 75 under Trajan. Right? Uh, but when I looked, it looked awfully like these were just somebody misinterpreting a slightly different design with a radiating halo. 
There are trading coins in which this is obviously a radiating diadem, and these look like simplistic photos. But you certainly get it going right the way back into Trajan. You get it much later on seals. This is a, a heptolite seal, right, showing the ladder diadem. You get it very occasionally on Gandharan seals, but not very much. Most Gandharan seals show a very simple, plain circle as the diadem. They very rarely show the device we see on the coins. And you get it on later Kushan Shah coins. And here is the king with it, and here is the god holding the same sort of ladder diadem effect. It looks like the two might be un unrelated to each other, that somebody has put something on the back to represent what the god's holding and changed that, and somebody's redesigned what's on the front. And it's not clear whether or not the two people are intending to depict the same thing, or they've borrowed two different bits of iconography from elsewhere. I did say at the beginning that most of this was stuff I didn't understand. So I'm not really giving you a lot in the way of answers at the moment. I did manage to find this, which is from Matara, and is probably about the same period, and shows the ladder diadem that appears on the coins over the shoulders in exactly the same way as it does. But it, I couldn't find any other example in sculpture. So the ladder diadem that's over the king's shoulders, which is a new piece of iconography at this stage, is almost certainly a real thing. Right? It's turning up elsewhere. It's, it's a depiction of something that either the king is officially supposed to wear or he actually does wear. The one that appears on the reverse that God is holding, it isn't clear whether or not it's a real thing or just copied from Roman examples, or simply an attempt to render what's on the front. So these are the coins that are being recut again. And I mentioned the whole process of dye wear. And I'm just going to apply this to the reverse now. So what we have here is an Ardoxo dye. Ardoxo is one of the big six. She's one of the goddesses that repeatedly appears. And you can see the striations. It's not a brilliant photograph, but the coin itself has clearly got parallel striations in it. That's virtually fresh, that dye. I have no idea how many coins you have to strike before those striations go away, because we don't have enough experimental data. But I'd be greatly surprised if it's more than a thousand. A coin that's showing these striations comes from a very early point in the dye's use. And we can, again, do the same process with Obverse 138, which is this die, dividing up different gods and goddesses involved based on the amount of wear that's shown on the dies. But here's something odd. On this particular die, Obverse 69, there are, note to me, 11 reverses. One of those reverses depicts Shaurira, divine might and authority. We saw earlier he's new. Ten of them depict our adoption. The obverse clearly undergoes huge amounts of wear. We get the radial striations, we get cracks. The reverses don't appear to undergo anywhere at all. Every reverse I've got good images for, I have an example showing the working marks. So the mint went to enormous trouble to keep this obverse in use. It kept replacing the reverses, even though they were not worn or damaged. So it had done that previously by changing the god. On this occasion, it does it regardless of whether or not it changes the god. So the first procedure makes a lot of sense. It's batch control. It's it, something's changing the time. The second procedure is very hard to understand. Why is the god not changing on this particular coin? This coin is probably from the end of the period, I think. But even so, it's still very strange. Very quickly, the quarter status. So the mint makes both full units and quarter units. Full units of about 8 grams of quarter units, 2 grams. The quarter units always have the closed jacket, but you can distinguish them based on whether or not they've got this new ladder diadem over the shoulders, or flames coming out of the shoulders, or not at all. And then something really interesting. These are the reverses we see. Ardoxo, she's one of the big six. Mao, one of the big six. Miro, one of the big six. Faro, one of the big six from the units. Shaurira, one of the big six. No exceptional gods here. And the figures here are not the figures we see there. So whereas in the main for the main units, we have a ratio of 10, 15 reverses for every obverse die. Here, we're much more normal, sort of three to one. So they're making quarters, but whatever procedure is operating in the main coins to inflate the use of reverse dies and to take them out of production when they're still very fresh, is not operating in the quarters. The quarters are following the same procedures that are already in place at the Kushan Mint. 
We do have a very strange quarter here, which appears to show the de design that the main mint is using in phase four, just before phase five happens, with a young portrait of King, but holding the spear over his shoulder, which is one of the new features of the phase five production. However, this coin's made at the subsidiary mint. It's not made at the main mint. Very close, it's a quarter, this is a unit, but they, they show you the similarity of the design other than the sphere. This is a quarter made at the main mint. And what it appears to indicate is that we'd previously worked on the assumption that because both mints change from having one type of design to having another type of design, that this happens at the same time. That there is essentially a central control that says, we don't like the present design, change it, replace it with a new design. It seems likely, however, given the way in which the subsidiary mint changes, and it frequently does not seem to understand the elements of iconography that we have here. So what actually happens is the main mint changes its design, and then at some point after the main mint has changed its design, it gives instructions to the subsidiary mint to change its design. Central control of both mints is not operating well. Central control of the main mint is still working, but the main mint is acting to feed into the subsidiary mint at a later stage. So our understanding of how the two sets of phases match up has certainly changed since I start putting the catalogue together. Uh, this was a quick thing I, I wanted to point out, which anybody who'd been at the talk I gave on Viva Carfizes a few years ago would have been wondering, uh, you know, how many people are involved in this? Uh, when Viva Carfizes was making his coins, I demonstrated that there were multiple people engraving the die. Somebody was engraving the legend, somebody was engraving the, the picture. That's not happening here. This die at the very beginning of its use, it's still got the working marks. There is a letter engraved across the top of the king's halo. The king's spear is engraved across the top of the next letter. There's a couple of other examples. I'm reasonably confident that's the way around it works. That can't happen if two people are engraving the two separately. That sort of mutual overlap can only really happen with one engraver working his way down the coin and engraving different bits of legend and design at different times. So, does any of this matter? That was the, the so we went through a lot of detail, and I've spent far too much on time on this, no matter what the historical results are coming out of this, it wasn't worth my time. Um, you're only happy to put up with it for an hour. I've spent three months looking at it. In the middle of Hifishka's reign, we have a massive reduction in the weight of copper coinage, and the mint located in Kashmir, it's the mint, closes uh, at some point in his reign, and a new mint opens in the city of Matara. There are repair works that take place at temples. We have the inscriptions recording the repair work. The subsidiary mint becomes stuck. I mentioned that there's one die I have 70 plus examples of. That's the die at the subsidiary mint. What seems to happen is the subsidiary mint seems to no longer be able to make our first dies. It keeps one die running until it's completely destroyed it. And it keeps it running for an immensely long period of time. There are something like 50 reverse designs known to us, reverse dies known to match with that reverse die. And that seems to overlap with the beginning of this phase. So the main mint adopts a new design, reforms the iconography, and then after some period of time sends some people to the uh, subsidiary mint and tells them to get their act sorted out and reform their design. And one of the questions that we've sometimes played with before is whether or not all these little elements that seem to indicate problems, crisis, are in fact connected. There's no way really to know this. You can look at these and say, oh, well, they all come from slightly different points. You can push this one back to 156, this one forward to 170. They're just the random scatter of normal activity that would take place there. Or you can push them all to the edges of their boundaries and say, oh, look, they're all basically about halfway through. They all occur at about the same time. And they therefore raise the question, is there a loss of central control in the latter part of the Vishka's reign? Does the political centre lose control over the various points that are doing work, whether that's production, maintaining temples or making coins. And if that's the case, is this a reassertion of central authority? We're seeing iconographically the effect of the centre reasserting its authority, beginning at the main gold mint and gradually spreading out from there. And one of the things that came into my head and I don't know if this is true, this is, this is reaching somewhat, is that the mint clearly, for whatever procedure it's operating, doesn't need new types on its reverses. It only needs new dies. That's what its repetition of our doc show tells us. 
that it doesn't actually need to change the god. For its own procedural purposes, it would be perfectly happy making the same god, but just changing the die on a regular basis. Does the political centre need new types? Have they issued the mint with a list and instruction saying, make these? And this is why we suddenly see this proliferation of coins which occur in only a single die, but have an entirely new god. And in the Rabatak inscription, which is a great testimony that Kanishka puts up at the very beginning of his reign, includes a line which doesn't receive much attention, but it's at the very beginning of its titles. It says, the autocrat, worthy of divine worship, who has obtained the kingship from Nana, she's the lion goddess, lion standard, and from all the gods. Is this moment a restatement of Kushan authority right, by deliberately placing onto the coins every god? by saying, okay, fine, you get away with these six normally, but just go and put all the designs you can on. So has the study we're doing repaid the amount of effort that went into it in terms of historical design? I think almost certainly not. These are, these are pretty small gains. But we do now know much more about what the Mint is doing, even if we do not always understand why it's doing it. And some elements of what the Mint is doing are clearly related to wider political issues within the Kushana Empire. Thank you very much for listening.